I'm a feminist, but when I was in the passport office earlier getting my biometrics taken for my visa, getting my fingerprints taken, and when the guy started being super talkative and somewhat flirty with me, instead of being like, hey, could you not and do your job? I was just kind of like, hey, don't kick me out of the country. <laughs> <laughs> what what are you meant to do like do you know what I mean I didn't know how to be like hey hey could you yeah I know you just found out that I'm a comedian but could you please shut the fuck up and uh take my photo I mean was this guy where was he at the passport office yeah he was the fingerprint guy I feel like the appointment is supposed to last for like 20 minutes I was there for like 40 minutes I think he was just like chatting he was just chatting, and I was like, I'll entertain this conversation. It was insane. At one point, he asked me if I thought that Beyonce or Solange was more attractive, and I managed to wiggle out of it by saying Jay-Z. <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> That's a double I'm a feminist bot, Kima. I blame him a lot because he shouldn't be floating on his job, especially when his job is, you know, you might yeah. feel like, oh, is this going to affect my visa? But... I'm a feminist, but also you are looking extra fine today. Extra fine. Thank, ha, I did lean into it as well, but I wish I didn't lean into it because it didn't make the appointment go by faster. You are glowing. That's no excuse. I'm not victim blaming, but you are glowing. My feminine wiles. Your hair's looking fine. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of feminine wiles. Uh, I mean, you have uh, them coming out the wazoo, but. I, okay, I had sex recently. Fine. Fine. <laughs> I had sex last night. It's fine. Uh, yes. There is uh, something uh, pulling out of me. Okay. All right. So is that, that's, that's, we've come to the nub of it now. <laughs> That's, that's why, okay? You've got the glow, yes. the post-coital glow. It's true. I came, okay? <laughs> okay, great. I'm a feminist, but can this whole episode really be about Benefer? J-Lo and Ben Affleck, please. Has something happened to Oh, okay. Ben so Ben Affleck J -Lo. and J-Lo have got back together. Oh, have that's they? right. They've oh got gosh. back together and they are posing in poses that they posed in the first time around in the noughties. So there's a famous shot of j-lo yeah cup in the butt cup in the butt yeah so our amazing guest maridol's just chipped in and she's asked a salient question that i think a lot of our listeners not a lot of our listeners but some of our listeners may be also asking mm. has something happened with ben affleck and j-lo yes mm. they've got back together they're snogging in public it was j-lo's 52nd birthday and she was recreating Sort of classic J Lo Ben Affleck images from when they were together in the noughties. Paparazzi in times. Including in the music video Jenny from the Block, there's a famous image of he's got his hand on her butt and she's lying face down on a boat. Mm. Um, they recreated that. But then my friend Raven Smith honed in on his face and said, he's not enjoying this. And then there was a pulled back shot where you could see the photographer taking the picture because it sort of just looked like not a selfie because obviously their arms went out, but someone else on the boat, yeah, one of their friends, yeah. just took it and was like, oh, this is a cute moment. But it turned out to be a hide photographer. Oh, fascinating. I, I think this needs its whole own guilty feminist episode is what I'm suggesting. Uh, it's interesting to me because – what, like, the relationship, I think the stuff around Britney Spears especially, it's kind of highlighted the relationship between, like, the paparazzi and these uh, photographers and these folks. And, um, yeah, I don't know. Is it bad? Like, I'm a feminist, but I enjoyed the photo more when I thought it was a sneaky. <laughs> now that I know it's, like, one of their friends, I'm kind of like... Sorry, that's you guys are gross. <laughs> <laughs> now you know it's all planned for you. But in a way, if you enjoyed the photo at all, surely you're going to enjoy it now. You know, effort was put in. That's Lighting true, and that thought of. people care, and they that they wanted us sure. to experience that joy. They cared enough to trick you into thinking this is just yeah. a joyful, playful moment. So yeah. I'm just saying. I you, thought his hand was on her butt for hours, and that photo just happened to have been captured. I feel I'm a feminist, but Kima, I'm now judging you as slightly naive. Oh, I mean, <laughs> forgive me. I just found myself.
transported back to the days of yesteryear when I also didn't give a shit about them being together. <laughs> you do and I'm a feminist bot. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist, but I recently started seeing someone new and we're out to dinner and she said to me, she said, hey, I'm the man. And I said, yeah, there is no the man. Like, we're both here. Like, neither one of us is the man. Mm. And then she said, yeah, I know, but, like, I'm the man. And instead of, like, fighting that, I was just like, oh, well, I guess I'm the little lady. (laughs) 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 I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) Okay, so (laughs) I guess I'll just have to lay down. (laughs) Enjoy playing with the binary. Yeah, I was like, we we know what it is, but thank you for saying who you feel like you are in this dynamic. And, you know, h- here we are. And let's just say that uh, I've really enjoyed being a, a little lady. Mm. I'm a feminist, but I predict Schwimmer and Aniston to be the next reunited couple from Days wow. of Yore. And what? I believe they hinted at it. In the Friends reunion episode when they said, oh, we had a huge crush on each other in season one. Why would they tell us that? We couldn't You're do anything crazy. about it because we were both with people then. But are they with people now? No, no, they're not. Neither of them with You're people. Crazy. Why are they telling us that? They're telling us that because if you're in your 50s, you want a huge revival. What do you do? You get back together, fulfill everyone's expectations. Everyone's That's like, true. oh, my God, you're our favorite. You're the greatest of all time. You're the good. So I am predicting a brief liaison between Schwimmer and Aniston. Now, I don't know if these relationships are real. I don't know if they're publicity stunts. I don't know if they're a mix where you think, have some sex, make some money, sell some records, have three movies out on Netflix. I don't know. But I'm predicting a Schwimmer Aniston double act. I was in the shops um, earlier and like uh, these stores, I don't know who says what trends are. I don't know who started it, but in all of the like 18 to 30s shops right now there's this like 70s trend happening and i feel like when in doubt just take it back baby you know and that's what they're doing and uh, you know you just go for it why not celebrities of your yeah hey maybe frida Kahlo and diego rivera will get back together i mean it wasn't a good idea the first time but people are going retro why not well, Schwimmer and Aniston never got their moment. They said they only ever kissed on screen. They never got their hand on the butt photos. So I'm going to say there's going to be a second Jenny from the block. Yes. Hooking up with an old friend. Yeah. I'm a feminist, but since uh, the woman I'm seeing told me that she was the man, <laughs> I've been feeling quite like femmy. And um, she's having, like, an event later this week. And I've bought, like, dresses for the first time in several years. And I'm like, maybe I just needed all this time with someone to show up and tell me that I was not the man. (laughs) I don't know what's happening. It's a mess. I'm a mess. But I'm very excited to let my legs out for a walk. I'm so jealous of all this Gen Z open door fluidity, I'm androgyny so playing up and down the scale with these, you know, with gender expression. It's so awesome. And I, I don't know why. I don't need to be jealous. I could do it. Yeah. I could be bold. I could be Come bold. On. Victor Victoria, girl. I might go a little bit more. Maybe I'll go, I'll try a tie. The thing is, <laughs> I've got <laughs> hips and a bum. Maybe but- I'll try a tie. Yeah. I'm saying but I like, try a tie. All kinds of people got hips. All kind of, People be having hips all the time, <laughs> okay? You ever seen a cis man with a giant badunkadunk? <laughs> Come on now. Love the little cheeks on a chap. <laughs> <laughs> look, okay, <laughs> Cheeks right. on a chap, baby. I might, I might try an androgynous look. I cut my hair sort of shorter and chicer. I might put a little, you know, slide in it and make it look a little bit like a 1920s flapper and then do that uh, Put a little tiny, put a tiny mustache, have a a kind of Charlie Chaplin. Do you think I could do a drag king? 
I think the question is why haven't you already? See, I think what's fascinating about the whole uh, situation is even though I'm fully aware that there is no the man, do you know what I mean? For some reason, like after challenging it, I'm just, I'm just like, oh, oh, and I'm just like, I'm a delicate little flower, and it's insane. I don't know what that is. I'm excited. Can you please send me pictures of all your dresses? Definitely. I will do a fashion show. I'm a feminist, but the news that Simone Biles has withdrawn from the Olympics when she is the number one in the world is a decision I support as a feminist and a woman and as someone who is concerned for mental health issues. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What happened? Why did she withdraw? I don't know the news. No one tells me the she's news anymore. She's a gymnast, anymore. but she's the sort of secret weapon. Yeah. She withdrew, she's from Houston. She's incredible. There you go. So she withdrew because she said, there's too much pressure on me. I don't trust my mental health. And I also don't trust I'm not going to fall when there's so much pressure on me. I've just decided to pull out. Oh, and good she's the girl. best in the world. So this is, I support this as a feminist and a woman, as someone who is concerned for mental health issues, but also as a fan the, of gymnastics. But also the best in the world just said, oh, fuck it, it's too much. And that made me really feel like, oh, thank mm. God. Thank yeah. God someone else yeah. can't cope. And someone so amazing yeah. can't cope. The, the best in the world can't cope. That's just made me, given me a free pass forever to just go, no. Ah, oh, it's too much. But too honestly, much it's interesting. And I love, I love seeing this recently with like Naomi Osaka as well. Uh, these, you know, amazing, incredible, hardworking people who, you know, I think previously have been driven to, you know, unhealthy places mentally and physically, especially gymnasts. Mm -hmm. They do really weird stuff to the bodies of gymnasts. Um, yeah, so for them to say, actually, no, thank you. I'm going to prioritize myself over this country's idea of victory, you know, over this, like, athletic imperialism or whatever, you know, like, I think it's so cool. And to say, I don't need to do this. What I need to do is to take care of myself. Ooh, impeccable. And she got to light the Olympic flame. So cool. She got to cool. light the flame. I love yeah. that. I love that so much. From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Kima Bob, and our very special guest, Maridal Wadwa, talking about creating your own world. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Kima Bob, and we are talking about creating our own world. So, Kima, have you been doing any work lately in building your own world? Because I feel like Ugh. Benefer has. Don't mean to go on about Ben Affleck and Jennifer Le Lopez again, but they've been sort of reinventing an old world with a series of staged pictures. <laughs> yeah. And they've yeah. been like, well, we create the universe and everyone wants that to be true. So we're, we're all buying in, whether it is or it isn't. It's not relevant, really. It's just like, I think, yeah, <laughs> I would like, I'd like a bit of nostalgia now. I'd like a Take bit of sentimentality. Me back, please. Exactly. I think everyone's a bit over the present uh, and they're just like, can I be transported into like the naughties? Uh, and specifically into some couple that I remember being weirdly invested in when they made Geely, but otherwise not so much. Not so much. Uh, so have you done any <laughs> work on building your own uh, world? I have, actually. I think um, it's an interesting position to be in, um, being a person who works in comedy, a privileged position. I feel like a lot of people look at us and say, oh, you must be living the dream or whatever. And oftentimes we live in something. Um, and I think more recently it's um, become important to me to put good things out in the world and also to, I don't know, actually take care of myself. I think for a long time mm. I was um, struggling so much for not only like financial security, but also to be seen and acknowledged as like good at what I do, that I was sacrificing, you know, my well-being. 
And now that I find myself in a more healthy place, um, both in recognition and in I can pay my rent. Oh, my God. Did I tell you I used to hold, like, rent strikes with my flatmates because, like, we couldn't afford our rent sometimes. And so our uh, flat was pretty fucked up. So we'd just pick one issue to highlight to the landlord if one of us was, like, short on rent. And we'd be like, oh, you want the money? We want to not have this leak. Um, oh, was, my God. Like, epic times. Um, so now I'm not having to do that. Um, the fact and, that you're not having to withhold rent for a number of days while a landlord fixes a leak. Yeah. Be like, is we want relaxing. a refrigerator that functions properly. How about that, Jeremy? That's his actual name. Um, and <laughs> and um, now I find myself in a place where I've not gotten over that habit of uh, saying yes to everything or scrounging. And I find myself not so connected to who I am or what I actually want and I find myself mm. reacting to what people want from me. Have you faced this? Yes. I am someone who is very reactive and I, oh, this has come along. Oh, do you, can you do this? Would you do this? You know, and I'm yeah. like, well, that sounds fun. Or I need the money or I, you know, want to help this charity or, you know, yeah. and I find myself saying yes to too much all the time. My post-pandemic world that I'm recreating is sort of how to ease back into social life while keeping the things I was doing, the new routines around exercise and eating nutritiously and resting properly Ooh. and s sleeping a full night's oh my sleep. Gosh, yes. The real world's eating into those things now. Yeah. And of course the real world is welcome, but I'm trying to keep a balance. So I still do those things. Like I'm almost like terrified to let go of all my exercise commitments and things like that you know, just to that. be more reasonable about it you know not yeah. to be like every morning it has to be this da, 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 da. and I got sick last week and I not no COVID did the test mm. it was just a sore throat but it was a really sore throat and I went to bed for a couple of days and let myself rest and just thought you don't have to be this routine and I think the routine was the thing that was keeping me like feeling like I've got a thing I've got something I've got routine and I've never yeah. been routined but also and so it's now, quite grounding I think and I feel like a lot of people have taken on healthier practices I've taken on a more mindful way of being and over the past couple of weeks that's gone to shit so <laughs> <laughs> Mindfulness. I have no what's, idea. what's happened? Now we're allowed I, out. I have no that's idea been what's replaced going by on drinking. anymore. Yeah. yeah. That's been mindfulness has been replaced by a drinking habit. I worked um, up my meditation habit from non existent to like a good twenty minutes every morning feeling like, yeah, now I'm ready for the day. And over the past week or so, since they've started allowing things to happen in the world, I'm struggling to focus for like ten minutes. It's it's mm. nuts. And I'm just like, I think if my post pandemic world looked like all the wholesome things I started to do for myself during my lockdown world, and then like was able to like healthily combine that with like existing in a safe way. Ooh, yes. it's yes. just a bit sudden, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And can I say the experience we had on Saturday, we went to the Soho Theatre. Mm -hmm. to do Shedinburgh, which is sort of last year when the Edinburgh Festival couldn't happen at all. Mm. Francesca Moody decided to do a version of it in a shed that we could be live streamed and there was no audience. But this year at the Soho Theatre, there could be an audience and we were allowed to have 80% occupancy. And it was noon on a Saturday. We only had a few days to advertise it because it was they kind of last lovely. minute. And I was so nervous. I was like, what if people don't come out anymore? What if this? What if this? What if this? And what is the because world? we were in a very privileged position of being able to advertise Guilty Feminist shows and people knew that we were, you know, it was a community feel to it. So if they came along, we would, you know, put together a bill that they didn't necessarily know that you were going to be on, but they knew somebody who reflected their value set would be saying something that they would want to learn about and doing some comedy they would want to hear, that they didn't need to feel like anxious that suddenly the comedy was going to take a turn that was going to make them feel uncomfortable. So we were in a very privileged position of, of people wanting to come out and be with us. So I was nervous about it. And also because I've really enjoyed the socially distanced shows we've been able to do, but it's not the same as having a full house because, you know, so when I went out to the theater and there were cameras between us and the audience, so I was like, how's this going to be? And when I walked out, it was as full a house as we were legally allowed to have. And 
I said something and the audience laughed. And then I said something else, the audience laughed. And it was like this old symbiosis mm. that I have not experienced since, I would say, February last year. Because even March last year, although it was amazing, we were all aware we should really be indoors and this was headed towards a lockdown. Mm. So February was the last time I felt super free with an audience. Oh. And honestly, my experience on Saturday was, you know, I, you know I'm not a religious person anymore, but it was almost spiritual because – it was like a part of myself I did not believe in anymore. I'd mm. forgotten. I didn't really believe in it anymore. Came to life because uh. it was like surfing with the audience. Like the audience give you and you give them and they give you it. And so, so even those weird. shows we did last summer outside, which I loved and they were wonderful, we knew we were only allowed out to be in a quad for 10 minutes, then get back in. And so it wasn't the feeling that I had on Saturday. Honestly, I think I felt talented for the first time in a year and a half. Nelly. Well, being a performer is such a weird thing because I think a lot of people will um, literally will look at us and say, oh, well, you're in such an uh, empowered place, right? You're, doing, you're living what you want to do. You're living the dream. But it's interesting because I feel like um, some people at their job, they're able to feel good about it uh, every time they do it you know, or at least know I'm competent. This is what I do. Um, and over the past year, that's changed for a lot of people. And at the same time, for I feel just as many people, it hasn't, you know, and our version of employee of the month, we haven't been able to get that kind of feeling. There is no like boss to give us a good job. You know, there's no like promotion. No. That's like the audience. And can I say, if you came out to any of those shows in the between times, thank you so much for coming out. It meant so much to me. And I did have a wonderful time. It's not that I'm diminishing those shows. I was so grateful for you. And I felt so loved by you. And I felt so in love with you. So if you came out to any of those shows that weren't Soho Theatre, please know that I loved them. And But there was just something about we're out the other side of this and we're allowed an 80% occupancy in like a 400 seater. So oh. that felt super full. And we were just like, it was just something about the element of it. And I honestly, I felt like, oh, it's back and it hasn't left me. And I'm so grateful. But I saw people crying at Latitude as well at the Latitude Festival because they played big audiences and they were, comedians were in tears, hard boiled old school comedians were in tears afterwards going, I played an audience, you know, it like felt something, there was something about this weekend that felt those shows were outdoors in Latitude, of course, but that it felt different this weekend. Yeah. And I, well, I'll I, tell I'm you just what, so grateful for it. The weirdest thing to me was when we had lunch after. And I was just like, uh, 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 like uh, that's, that's what felt real, you know? So we had like the show bit and I was like, whoa, people. And then I was like, hey, do you want to grab a bite? And I was like, oh, we can grab a but like I just, it's just it's 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 too real it's too real but it's stuff as well that we shouldn't be feeling and i'm if you're in australia and you're suddenly in a lockdown again i fully apologize we've been in a lockdown for so long when you guys were out and you know look hopefully we won't be back in again but we all know that we could yeah so you know like this is just me going feels like i've come up from air after being underwater for a very very long time so it's a balance between me going, but I still want to do my exercise every day, but I still want to make sure I yeah. eat the regular times. I still want to make sure I don't go to bed at 2 a.m. the way I did last night after suddenly having like, oh, I've got to write this script. I still want to do all those things, though. I still want to look after myself. Well, I think also we need to, to maintain. I think it's really important. And there are things that all of us will have adopted over the past year, and they're important to hold on to because like – they're not bad for us now. It's just that we've not done them in this context. And I think the fatigue, it's like pandemic fatigue of just wanting it to be over or wanting to move on. But I think some of those um, healthy habits that we've built for ourselves, they've become safeguards, um, you know, quite good for our sense of mental stability and things of that nature. And um, if we do end up back in the lockdown, you know, those will be our constants. Um, and it's so tough. It is a big shift. And I think we shouldn't um, look down at ourselves for uh, slipping up because things have just changed quite quickly. Um, and it's scary as well because, like, they could change again. Um, they likely will change again. And so I think I just want to take a moment, I guess, to encourage everyone who's adopted things into their schedule, their life, their routine. 
while they were more restricted to not let go of them if they were helping you feel better because they still will. That's very good advice, Kima Bob. You are a wise soul. I'm wise just an 80 years. year old lady in a 27 year old body. <laughs> You're the Yoda of the guilty feminist, in my opinion. Thank you so much. I prefer to be the baby Yoda, thanks. You are the baby Yoda, but you have better syntax. <laughs> your syntax is flawless. And better your skin. Wisdom, your wisdom's just <laughs> as, just as Yoda y. So, you know, you are the, the new and improved Yoda. An, oh, an Obi Wan Kenobi. An Obi Wan Kimobi. Oh, I love it. I wish I had ever seen those films. <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I can I just say also while I'm saying things of sentimental value, if you've ever written to me and I haven't been able to get back to you and, mm. you know, or you've written to me this, I get so many requests for people to come and be on the podcast or people saying, hey, I think so-and-so would make a good guest. And we really do put everyone into the mix and we try and get a good variety. And, you know, we are one podcast. We're not, you know, we're just, we're not the BBC. So it's, it's, we have such limited resources. So I'm so sorry if I've ever disappointed you. I'm so sorry if I haven't got back to you. I hear and see you. If you've ever sent me fan mail and I didn't have your address to write back or I was on tour and I just didn't have the resources or the energy or the bandwidth, I just want to say I appreciate every single one of you, everyone who's ever taken the time to write to me Mm. to suggest a guest, even if we haven't had that person on. We only have 52 shows a year and we probably get offered you know, a thousand guests a year. So we, so we, but please keep suggesting people because that's, you know, also how people get through. So thank you for all of your suggestions. Thank you for all your kind words. Thank Mm. you for your criticism, which has shaped the show. Thank you for coming out. Thank you if you've never been able to come out, but you've supported us in another way by telling a friend, by rating, reviewing, or subscribing. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, thank you for everything that you've ever done. And I'm feeling very sentimental at the moment because we are on this precipice of coming back out and Ah. who knows, you know, for how long or it's how, getting real, where we're allowed to go, whether we can tour, where we can tour, oh. all of those things. And but- please keep showing love because it, it's so greatly appreciated. And I think, like, in a weird way, I've come to learn uh, love. Like, real love is when you give it and with no, you know, real expectation or demand. And the real love that the listenership has shown me over the years has been absolutely incredible and um like besides the amazing conversations that i'm privileged to be a part of by being a part of this platform the community that i found myself a part of of people who care about this podcast um, I'm so grateful for it. Are we all going to cry today? Is that yeah, the vibe? I think so. Well, look, it's not going to get any better with our guest in terms of the, the sentimentality and the, because this is somebody who really has created her own world in so yeah. many ways and created an amazing world for other people. Hello, Guilty Feminist. On the 10th and 11th of September, we have two really big, spectacular all singing, all dancing shows at the South Bank Centre. We're at the Queen Elizabeth Hall, 7.30pm. Get your tickets now at southbankcentre.co.uk or you can find tickets to anything at guiltyfeminist.com and click through. We will be coming to Australia and New Zealand in October and November. Some of the best shows we've ever done have been in Australia and New Zealand, so we're very, very excited to come back. We will be on the 21st of October in Wellington, 22nd in Christchurch, 23rd in Auckland, 26th in Sydney, 29th in Perth, 31st in Canberra, uh, 3rd of November in Adelaide, the 5th of November in Melbourne and the 8th of November in Brisbane. So get tickets now, guiltyfeminist.com. If any of the dates have to move, we'll transfer your ticket over or refund your money. So buy with confidence, but do buy as soon as you possibly can because tickets to the Australian and New Zealand shows always sell out. And now back to the podcast. Um, so we have a little content warning before our guest today because she manages rape crisis centers. So we will discuss this subject very sensitively, but just if that's something you're not feeling today, then, you know, this is a place where you could duck out of the podcast and maybe revisit it at a time when you're feeling more up to it, if that's something you would like to do. Our guest today was born in India. 
migrated to Scotland to study, and soon after started working in women's services, first with BME Women at Shakti Women's Aid, and then at Rape Crisis Scotland on a national helpline. She has managed the Fourth Valley Rape Crisis Centre and is now the CEO at Edinburgh Rape Crisis Centre. She is trans, has two children, a husband, and loves a sari. Please welcome Mariddle Wadwa. Woo! Riddle, riddle, riddle. Thanks. Um, I actually have a, I am a feminist. Oh, please. Oh, my gosh, yes. I had, to work really, I had to work really hard to think of one because I'm such a good feminist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm a feminist, but I don't think a man's place is in my kitchen. Oh. In fact, I'm so bad that uh, my husband is meant to take care of dinner tonight and I gave him so many instructions that he will not be cooking in my kitchen tonight. So, yeah, I don't think a man's place is in my kitchen. Hey, hey. So you have given him so many instructions, he's like, you just need to do it yourself. You don't trust me. Uh-huh. So my children will be eating other food, not food. <laughs> is he ordering a delivery? That's so funny. <laughs> is he just ordering them a pizza off delivery because your instructions are so... Frankly, fascistic. I, I, yes. I see. I see. Yes. Well, listen, you know, as I'm a feminist, but go, you know, it can be a lot worse. You've heard Kima's. Impeccable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Impeccable. Um, I love it. Tell I, me. Yeah. Oh, I'm we the love opposite a, of a that bus riddle. in the streets and a bus in the streets. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get fired. <laughs> More like a boss in the kitchen and a boss when she's bitching. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, baby. <laughs> um, so, Mariddle, I am extremely interested in your work in Scotland. You were born in mm -hmm. India, but you migrated to Scotland. What made you start wanting to work in women's services? Um, I don't think there was a plan. Uh, so for any migrant listening, um, we have two here, actually, including me, or three of us. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I was think, born in Australia. Kim was born in yes. America. You were born in India. So three of us. And I think... And we're um, taking over the country, baby. Uh -huh, we didn't vote leave for this. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> um, it happened uh, not deliberately. When I graduated, I did a master's at Edinburgh University. There was a a job going in at Shakti uh, and I just completed a degree master's in training and they needed someone to do some training. It wasn't by design. I just applied for this job. It looked interesting. Um, obviously, I had been around violence. I grew up in a home with domestic abuse. I experienced violence as a trans woman in India. And so it looked like somewhere I wanted to work. And I applied and I got the job and I just stayed like before working in women's services, I used to teach people how to sound American in India in a call center. So it is not by design that I got into this work, but I've stayed by design because in fact, I went, I moved back to India and then moved back again to work at, at Shakti Women's Aid. Um, wow. Just pause there for a second. You, in India, used to teach people how to sound American in call centers. That's so best exotic Marigold Hotel. Do you remember Judy Dench does that? She yes. starts teaching people in call centers to sort of chat to people in Britain Incredible. on the phone, but she's not yes. giving them an accent. Tell us more yes. about that. So this was in the early years of the call center industry. I started working in it in 2000. Mm. And so this was about 2003, 2004 when there was a real pressure to sound like the people yeah, from the country yeah. that we were in, because I don't think like, people had were fully aware as yet that call centers had moved, that they had left. And in fact, when I did work in call centers, taking calls, I used to work in a call center that provided sort of support of uh, finance, you know, like managing the, the bank accounts or the bank cards of people who received food stamps and social security in the US. So we spoke mm. to people from across the US. And and I, I speak five languages and this is like the funniest. And we like and my name was Louise. I had, you know, we had no understanding of racial politics or 
or anything. When people used to tell me, oh, you're finally a white American. I, I didn't understand what they meant. That's like, what so was the meaning funny. Of that? Oh my gosh. Like, all my colleagues sounded like they all thought we were Mexican, except when they heard me. But one day there was a, a Gujarati speaking woman on the phone and uh, her son was on the phone and I needed to speak to her like a good customer service agent in a bank. Um, and he said, oh, she won't understand you because she doesn't speak English. I said, well, I knew she spoke Gujarati just from her name. And I said, what oh. does she speak? And he said, uh, Gujarati. And I said, oh, I can speak to her in Gujarati. And oh, he said, what you, a moment. you can speak to her in Gujarati. And I oh. spoke to her in this, spoke to him in this really good, you know, my, my Zorash, I'm part Zorash. And so this Parsi Gujarati accent and he just put the phone down because he couldn't believe oh my that this, gosh. somehow this uh, Louise who sounded from yeah. this, you know, the South, like I had a real Southern drawl. Um, I can't, I can't replicate it anymore. But, oh my gosh. Um, That's just, absolutely incredible. And what a yeah. beautiful moment to share with him as well. Well, he was terrified. Uh, <laughs> so. uh, uh, he hung uh, up. I mean, <laughs> so you sounded like Friday Night Lights, Southern Hospitality and all. Uh 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 oh my gosh that's incredible i love that like fate destiny i don't know which one is more magical but i love (laughs) that that led you with all your skills and all the languages that you speak to work in like it's it's absolutely incredible because i think a lot of the um best things that happen in our lives they happen like through us and sometimes to us. And uh, I think it's absolutely incredible that you didn't plan to be working where you're working. How long have you been there now? Um, so I've worked in the women's sector now since 2005, late 2005, wow. so quite a few years. And when I worked at Shakti Women's Aid, you know, it was eye-opening not just to see and experience like what does domestic abuse really looked like, although I grew up in a home with domestic abuse, but to see the to see what it looks like in the mm-hmm. Scottish context and then the further marginalization of minority ethnic women, particularly immigrant women, because you know the, all the messages were and in at least in the early part of my career, you know, Scotland was still beginning to talk about domestic abuse and sexual violence a little bit more openly. It had sort of stepped out of women's organizations into a little bit more into the mainstream of the public sector. And, and, you know, the message was clearly leave your abuser. You don't have to live with this. Mm -hmm, There's help mm -hmm. for you. And when immigrant women would hear that message and accept that as though we were speaking to them, but when they came out and asked for help, they wouldn't have received it because particularly, uh, Kima, just listening to what you were saying earlier, you probably have no recourse to public funds. and. Mm Um, so, so many of those women with no recourse to public funds would not get any support because their immigration status would stop them from accessing a homeless accommodation, uh, refuge mm, spaces, mm. Um, welfare, all the things that you need to leave a relationship that, mm-hmm. that those really practical, basic needs that most uh, women who, who are not subject to immigration control can access. And while there are some exemptions, uh, there's something called the domestic abuse rule. For most migrant women, that is not accessible. And with Brexit and with, you know, the, the rules changing for EU nationals, I'm really afraid that we will see more and more women who don't meet the immigration criteria, who may not have uh, completed or acquired pre-settled status, who will now be denied because the immigration status this allows them from accessing public funds, which means housing yeah. benefit, which means job seekers allowance, all of these things uh, that you might need if you leave, because many women who leave end up being homeless. They end up either not being in employment or losing employment because they've left abusive relationships. So my work in Women's Aid in the early years of my career was around raising awareness about this. And it really transformed me. But I also found a real group of wonderful and mostly immigrant women of color working to change this and many of us still are even like 15 16 years later but also many of us were qualified to do other things with our lives but we couldn't Mm -hmm. find those 
you know, a space and those careers that we trained for because of racism, really, and found ourselves in this organization. So it's a real interesting journey how many of us got there. And for me, it was just luck and coincidence, but it changed my life completely. I love it. I don't know why. It always gets me like so excited and a bit (laughs) of chills because like we can make plans. Yeah. Uh But I feel like plans like rules are often made to be broken, shifted, switched up. Of course. Um, I wonder if you could have planned, you know, a life so beautiful and it sucks that you were like kept out of, you know, what you hoped to do, but where you find yourself is making such an impact. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as a trans woman, I think uh, the only plan I had was to be alive uh, for a long time. Was, you know, I did not want to die. And uh, so anything that has come after that is a real gift and a surprise. And I think like for me, uh, like I'm a huge fan of the Guilty Feminist and you cannot imagine how excited I've been uh, to, Ah! to be here and I was like uh, I was telling some of my colleagues like I think um like I may have taken up this job just so that I could get on the guilty feminist (laughs) (laughs) that's your real I'm a feminist but I'm a feminist but I started working with women who had experienced violence in shelters and all sorts of so my one hour of fame because <laughs> ultimately i wanted to get on the guilty feminist i mean that is that's the greatest i'm a feminist but of all time in my opinion you just, <laughs> we, thought, we thought we were comedians and the history comes blowing us out of the water with this nonsense <laughs> <laughs> um it's a really powerful story that sometimes when you're marginalized and you're not being given access to spaces you do want to be in, you end up helping other people who are also excluded from uh, spaces, but then ultimately that can be the most fulfilling thing any human being could do because you are clearly very engaged and energized by your work now Mm -hmm. and you clearly love it, you know, and uh, as well as I'm sure wishing there was no need for it, but you clearly are very – it, this is a you know something that you have found great purpose in understandably yeah. the shakti women's aid uh center you were working with black and asian women and then you moved to rape crisis scotland on the national helpline uh-huh. what were your experiences there well the helpline is a really incredible place um it is really it's still hard in our society today to talk about sexual violence And the ability to contact somebody and speak anonymously is a very important, sometimes first step or sometimes the only step to talk about your experience of sexual violence. And then there is a, it takes a huge amount of courage to do that, to talk about what's happened to you or even actually question whether what happened to you was abuse or not. I think we're still a society that is still not very good at talking about sexual violence, particularly sexual violence that is not rape. Because, you know, like, although I work in a rape crisis center, people think that only if you've experienced rape can you seek support. But actually, I think if you've been harassed on the street, you should be seeking support around this. Because, you know, like, there is no hierarchy of violence. Uh, It is Mm -hmm. the impact that we are interested in when we provide services. So. Um, the headline is that place where people phone either because they're questioning whether what's happened to them is is sexual violence, whether sometimes often mm. you would hear people talk about whether they are worthy of, of our time as workers who worked on that helpline or who work in big crisis centers or women's aid. Like, is this abuse? And the more marginalized you are in our society, the more harder it is for you uh, to get that answer. Like, like, A, the answer is, like, is what happened to me abusive? Because there's this whole intersection of being either trans or non-binary or black or brown or disabled. Because there are so many other acts of violence that are perpetrated against you on an everyday mm-hmm. basis. And then if sexual violence is part of that abuse, is this something that I can seek help for? And I, I love the people I worked with on the headline. I still have a really, really strong relationship 
with them. I host their pub quiz, uh, twice yearly pub quiz. <laughs> uh, Incredible. And it's real fun. But they are the most wonderful, warmest, kindest women I know. And it is a huge honor to have worked with them. So I used to train people who worked on the headline, but also to know that when anybody who phones, because it's open to anyone uh, who lives in Scotland to use the headline, they will be received and held and respected for whatever they're thinking around their experience of sexual violence. It truly is non-judgmental. And when we say, and most services will say that they're non-judgmental, and um, I would believe that they are, but I know that the spaces I, I work in currently in the National Helpline for Scotland is a really non-judgmental space. You will be heard. Um, you will be given time. You will be given space. There will be no pressure on you to report your experience to anybody. Like, you know, there's, sometimes there's this fear, this sometimes survivors, and that's the term we use on the headline or in the rape crisis movement in Scotland, uh, think that they must report what happened to them. Like, there is no pressure mm. to do that. Sexual violence is a loss of control. And everything that happens after that, in terms of your recovery, only you can control. That is your right. I think that's a gift that we must give ourselves if we've experienced sexual violence because the abuser has taken away that control. But everything that happens after that should be yours. It's your story. And we recognize that within our services. Um, and that's Aww. what that helpline is like. And in fact, that's what a rape crisis center is like as well, the one that I work in right now. You know, these are beautiful yeah. spaces. That's so beautiful. Yeah, completely. To not have to be worried that you'll be told what to do or how you should proceed. How you should be even, because you can be however as a survivor. It is your story and only your story. Yes. So much of the trauma is is a narrative. We were talking, I was talking to a friend recently and she was telling me that she had specifically told a man no and he um, clearly wasn't going to take no for an answer. So she just sort of thought, I'm just going to be into it then because I can't have that be my narrative oh so much of that she she saw him for a while afterwards and she said i now realize it's because then my story is the first night was a bit weird but then i was it was fine and i dated him and my story is not i'm a survivor of of rape and because she said i just couldn't live with it so i was just like and she said but you know she gets that ptsd from it but if you tell that story if you come out with that story Somebody says, well, if you continue to see him, if you dated him, if you slept with him again, then it wasn't rape. But of course, that isn't the case. So much of trauma is managing the story. Yeah. And when someone gives you that trauma, they say, here's this story to manage. And so one way of managing that story sometimes can be to go, this isn't what happened. I'll rewrite it. I'll quickly get on board Mm -hmm. because, as you say, someone's taking control. From you, and there are many, many, many other ways to control that, blocking it out, have it be something you can't look at, sure. or that you're you actually get a memory block sure. from. That there's all sorts of different ways, you know, yes. uh, not being able to work anymore, crying uncontrollably, yeah. being very angry, um, wanting revenge. There's so many different ways of managing the story, but that's what you're left with. That's what a survivor is left yeah. with. They're left with a story that they have to continually tell or reconcile and somehow manage in their daily life. And so the fact that you are there to hear that story on that helpline is everything because there's somewhere to put that story that's anonymous, that it's not, you know, sometimes you think I don't, you know, people think I don't want to tell my mum. I don't mm-hmm. want to give her that story now. I don't trust mm-hmm. my dad's response. I don't trust my brother's response. I don't trust my best friend's response. Yeah. I don't want oh to my gosh. that person in their mind. I know my place in their story and I don't want my story to look like this to them. There's so many different ways in which trauma victims need to carry the burden of a story with trauma at its heart and violence at its heart and a perpetrator and a villain in its heart. How did that shift when you went away from the National Helpline? So you were, instead of talking to people on phones, 
you then start managing the Fourth Valley Rape Crisis Center. I think managing a rape crisis center takes you a little bit away from that frontline work, but it's so valuable to hold those those stories, the stories of triumph and recovery. I think it's very important to know that the women's movement in Scotland, and I would say the wider United Kingdom, it has been set up. Its its history lies in survivors. The survivors set up these centers uh, mainly. Uh, and we we volunteer, we staff them. So how our services are designed and organized really are centered around survivors' voices and survivor experiences. Managing this repressive center is about making sure that the feminist ethos of equality, of inclusion, of love and kindness towards each other, who those of us who work and volunteer there, are central. But then we are functioning in a very patriarchal world. And my main role is to ensure that those feminist ideals are, are maintained. But the reality is that to maintain that, we need money and we need to be sustainable organizations. Uh, we need to be sitting at a table with our various partners and stakeholders and funders who often speak a different language in terms of how they view their role in ending sexual violence. It's often a little bit different to ours. But can yes. I ask what that kind of um what their attitude is like from those those positions of I think there is power. A, like like over the years and certainly right now in Scotland, I think there is a genuine desire and commitment to do better. But then if if you are from the police or the health service or any other big national mm. or the local authority or local council, you're bound by those patriarchal structures because, you know, like those those organizations were not made by women for women or, or people with mm -hmm. diverse gender identities. We just happen to have muscled our way in and but we are still functioning within those patriarchal systems. So their ability to respond in the way that we as rape crisis centers want them to respond, A, give us more money, uh, sustainable funding, be more flexible in how you offer particularly health services and so on, that takes longer. And also, you know, Scotland is a much smaller country to the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, so I can speak for Scotland. I think we have a much more, in my experience, a much more closer relationship with decision makers than maybe you do in in England, uh, and also you have a more challenging government at Westminster, whereas we have a slightly more left-leaning government here. Really? Um, we hadn't noticed. <laughs> so, so many of my uh, friends have moved to Scotland, like seriously, uh -huh. have gone like, we're out of here and they're up in Scotland. And when you guys go independent, uh -huh. there's going to be a lot of English refugees at the border trying to get in, I'm telling you, that's <laughs> nothing. Yes, I Probably. I feel like the um, nature of um, those bodies might be the idea of like reducing or like making things go away rather than understanding, trying to understand the complexities of these issues. I and think I'm there is a, in Scotland, certainly uh, we have a national trauma framework and we have big, big organ, public organizations you know, authorities, public bodies, trying to make their workforce more trauma-informed and the benefits oh, of that incredible. will be felt in the coming years. But to go back to your original question about what is it like to manage, I think there is a real tension between our ambitions of keeping rape crisis centers, inclusive, warm, safe, well-resourced spaces. So the biggest challenge I have is resourcing. So that is funding. That is sustainable. We often victim across i think this is true across the united kingdom to short-term funding so it's not like rape and sexual violence is going to go away in two years but yet many of us are funded in a year's contract two wow. years funding it's rare to see like five ten year funding wow um, and a lot of our funding comes from in scotland certainly you know we we have much more funding from the, the government and local authority than I would say our 
sister organizations down in England and Wales. And that is positive, but we have massive waiting lists. Like Edinburgh Crisis Center's waiting list was closed for a year during the pandemic. Like we were not taking any referrals at all. We are now, and we just received some additional money from the Scottish government to tackle waiting lists. And I think it, it really helps to have a feminist leading a government. Uh, and I think What's that, that like? So, what's that <laughs> like? Um, yeah, tell us more about that. <laughs> so without being party political, I think uh, there are a number of good feminists elected to the Scottish Parliament, including, I would say, the First Minister. If nothing, at least they will listen to you. You have better and easier access mm. to the challenges. And we've had survivors uh, who have had meetings with ministers and their local MSPs. And you you actively, you see uh, women across parties in the Scottish Parliament, you know, championing the cause of survivors of gender-based violence. But uh, sexual violence is really widely prevalent. Sexual violence services have been historically underfunded in, in Scotland. So we are just playing catch up with our demand. And I suppose this is what I'm talking to you about. This is the kind of work that someone who manages or leads or a crisis centre is having to do. So by being really innovative and making sure that my colleagues uh, have everything that they need, whether it's skills or the emotional space and their own well-being to be able to work with trauma. The other thing is to work to raise the profile of the centre so more survivors come to our centre to seek support and know that it is a safe space. Particularly for me, what's important is those who are missing in our service user groups. So we have, you know, we are largely mainly used by cis white women. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the work ahead is about making sure that those who are marginalized in our society and further away from the cis white heteronormative existence also know that the space is for them. Um, Oh, so important. And I think continuing the campaign for more resources, uh, reform of legislation, um, making sure that we don't have to take out a begging bowl everywhere we go. But that really is often a leader's job in the women's movement. I don't think I can have a conversation with anyone without asking for money, which, of course, I will be doing here, too. Uh, (laughs) Oh, I insist. (laughs) Sure, sure. Kima, (laughs) get your wallet out now. A hundred percent. Now look, I, I'm going to shake it out. I, there's going to be some stuff in there. A bit of it's going to be lint, but we are going to find some money, baby. <laughs> I believe in that. And I'm sure that the Guilty Feminists can stump up some cash as well, as well as our listeners. Um, two things you've said have really struck me. One is when you said just being alive is an ambition for a trans woman. Mm-hmm. And... I've heard trans women speak this way before, and I know many of our listeners will be feeling like it feels like a punch in the stomach to hear that. It feels like (laughs) physically painful to hear, oh, well, every year I'm alive is a year beyond what my expectation was, that this world is so violent towards trans women. And we know the statistics are there, but also sometimes people deny those stats online and they do sometimes they say well not really because and they you know you could make stats say anything but i think we all anecdotally know that if i'm going to get on a night bus tonight at one in the morning to get home from soho i might experience some harassment i might experience some guys going oh show us your tits or you know come over here darling i might and i am as a cis woman always Um, as all women are, on alert, especially at night, especially alone, you know, but even walking home in the day, I'm just sort of, I hold onto my bag. I'm just a low level alert at all times, like uh, of the danger. When I come into my flat and there's no one here, I look around in every room, you know, every woman understands this. But I also know if a trans woman who does not pass for cis And a trans woman never really knows, you know, from my close yes. trans friends who pass for cis, they don't really ever know if they, you know, there's moments where there's a double take or, you know, mm-hmm. and the whole passing for is problematic in itself, but to not yes. get into that, to just stick on this topic of danger and violence in the yeah. world. If a trans woman gets on the bus, 
it's almost impossible on a night blast that there will not be jeering, cheering, catcalling, mm-hmm. weird looks, double takes, whispering, yes. giggling, sneering, sympathetic nodding looks uh, from progressive people who are trying to kind of be like, but I like trans people. There's not going to be a, a neutral response. And the more dangerous that bus is just because it's full of, you know, drunk people who are beyond the, um, you know. Or, oh, who drunk are, people are the worst. Yeah, who are sort of out, you know, feel like they're outside the bounds of civility that they would maybe have in the day or if a place was better lit or, you know, those kinds of uh-huh. things. We know that that jeering and that cheering and that whispering and that giggling can easily escalate into insults, which are structurally yeah. violent, which can easily yeah. escalate into pushing and shoving, which can easily escalate into violence. We've all lived in the world and we all anecdotally know this, that it is much more dangerous journey for a trans woman home at night. That is not undermine or diminish for any of our listeners the dangerous journey you may have had and you may have every night. It doesn't diminish anyone else's journey, but we must admit collectively that it is more likely that a trans woman will come under fire and experience these very structurally violent, constant flicks of eyes and I don't know, oh God, and uh, and aggressive glares and that that can escalate into physical violence and that that can escalate into sexual violence quickly. So I just want to say as the owner of this podcast, I feel I need to say that in this space. I also know that there are many people who are concerned that if trans women can self-identify and come into a refuge, that that may trigger all sorts of things in cis women. Have you come up against this? Yes, I have. If you just Google my name, you will see evidence of what I've been going through for the last two or three years up in Scotland around this issue. Um, I know you described the situation of a night bus, but actually for trans women, even the day is dangerous. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because there is such a social license to be awful to us. And there absolutely is. It really doesn't feel like there is any any punishment of any or rebukement or anything, any consequences in most societies of this world, if not all, if you harm a trans person. And that was my experience growing up in India. Uh, I transitioned in India before I came here. And for the record, I I I had for those who are very interested in my in in what happens between my legs, um, because that is that is what the mythology around me has been created, you know, mm. as a as a, a woman, trans woman who works in the women's sector, mm. is that I don't have a gender recognition certificate. I have never transitioned, and usually they want to know if I have a penis or not. Um, all of that happened in India, and if you understood migration, you would know that I don't need a gender recognition certificate because I was a woman when I came here. My paperwork says so. But yes, there are these concerns, uh, misguided and downright dangerous. So between misguided and downright dangerous, there are a whole lot of opinions and feelings about self-identification. I think it's really important for people to hear that trans people self-identified before it was a word in the cis lexicon. Like, I am a trans woman and that is self-identification. But the state has decided to legislate, uh, or hopefully in Scotland, that doesn't look like it's happening in England anytime soon, to change the way we can change our birth certificate. That's all that's happening. But every other experience that we have as trans women, how we, or trans people more broadly, uh, how we engage with services, how we go about our life, everything works on a self-ID basis. And it's already been working. It is fine. Are there trans people that are dangerous? Yes, there are. Just as men can be dangerous and some women can be dangerous. Laws are made and they are broken. But we all know that that will happen. Uh, So to suggest that a few individuals who happen to be trans might abuse legislation or spaces, women's spaces, doesn't mean that you exclude a whole community. And secondly, Men already harm women because that's who they're really talking about. 
men already harm women without going into women's spaces or even if they like they can go into women's spaces if they like and my argument is that men are already in these women's spaces like for example a rape crisis center or a women's aid because who is making the decisions about how much money we get about who, you know who gives us planning permission it is not women alone so to, the argument that women's spaces will be somehow compromised from my perspective as a strategic thinker that's already happening because we are functioning in a man's world but to go into the very specifics about who gets access to these spaces i think it should be reassuring that Women's work services are very private services. We often organize our services, and I can speak to uh, rape crisis centers in particular, that we organize them in such a way that actually when you use our service, you might never ever see another survivor when you're in our building or in our space, except maybe in a group. So I don't know really what the argument is anymore. I think the argument essentially is from people is that we refuse to see the humanity of trans women in particular as people and we would rather that they are not here at all. Feels like a weird hypothetical fear like just this lack of understanding and oh ignorance ignorance runs rampant. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that have been thrown at me, I sort of already referenced, but I remember being in a meeting once where there was this this person who took the name of some trans woman who, you know, was accused of a crime somewhere in South Asia. And she asked the, you know, the representative of women's organizations, are you going to condemn this trans woman for carrying out an act of I think it was sexual violence. And I was like, well, I would like to condemn all men who commit acts of sexual violence by name and I will be here for the end of time. Why is it that you've never asked us to do that, you know, as as women's services? So what is this about? Preach. And when you before referred to men interfering in or getting somehow insidiously into women's spaces, you were referring to the accusation that if people can self-identify that a cisgendered man might go, ah, I identify as a woman to gain the door. <laughs> Presumably that's what you were talking about in terms yes, of... Yes, that is right, yes. because that's what they say. Uh, but also, like, that's how it started. And some might argue that that's what they're trying to protect by not allowing self-identification laws to pass in this country, uh, whether it's England and Wales or Scotland. But actually, if you really listen to them and, and see who has the platform now, Essentially, what they're saying is that trans women cannot exist. I have lived approximately half my life uh, as a post-transition. And they still, like recently in the last two, three years, people have started calling me a man. But this is what I have to say to them. Like, it has no impact on me. Because even before I transitioned, when I went to an all-boys Catholic school in India, no one ever called me a man. So if you think that it's some kind of gotcha, it isn't because, you know, like I've been called every name in the book to harass me. Being a, called a man was never one of them. And it does not bother me. So you can fuck right off. It's really um, interesting. So. Heck yeah. I think like the idea of um, men, uh, cis men being like, I'm a woman to gain access to services. I mean, isn't the answer to that to make sure that men have access to services? I don't think that's what they're saying, Kima. They're saying, yes, say, the, vi- they're say saying. the victim of the, or the survivor of the abuse was in the refuge. They're not saying a man 